Good morning, everyone. I think my voice checks okay. All right, so just by way of um, acknowledgments, there's been a lot of people involved with some of the MUC 16 work that I'm going to be talking about at the very tail end of this talk. So I just put this up front to start. So there's been a lot of interest in utilizing or harnessing the immune system against cancer. But sometimes what we don't fully appreciate is that this has been a very long and um, arduous process, all the way from Cooley's toxins in the um, 1800s, all the way to the identification of um, antibodies, and then to the, all the way to the approval or the first testing of antibodies um, in clinical trials. It's been a very long process, oftentimes uh, besieged by various um, starts and stops. And I'll try to highlight some of that as we go today. There's been a sustained interest, particularly in antibody therapy, perhaps only rivaled by our interest in vaccine therapy, mostly because of the utility or the flexibility of um, antibodies as a very broad-based platform for anti-tumor therapy. For instance, if we look at the basic structure or anatomy of an antibody, we have the FAB domain or the FAB region right up here, which is responsible for the antigen recognition or basically the targeting module of the antibody. And this is coupled to the FC domain, which is basically the, um, not only the stabilization domain, but also confers specific properties to the antibodies themselves. Now, one of the things that we could do is actually modify some of the carbohydrate groups along this um, heavy chain to promote different effects in our antibodies. Furthermore, we can actually alter the amino acid sequence of the antibody of the FC domain itself. We can change the FC domain from different subtypes. I'll highlight some of them as we go. Again, to promote different properties, whether we're interested more in um, complement-mediated cytotoxicity or we're interested more in um, antibody-mediated um, cellular cytotoxicity. Another interesting thing we can do is actually couple radionucleotides to the FC domain itself, and this can have um, utility when we do tumor imaging or perhaps delivery of radiotherapy targeted to tumors themselves. Lastly, oh, well, second to last, um, a common property that I'll talk about a lot today is using the antibody as a delivery vehicle for a payload. And um, this could be a chemical drug, a toxin, or it could even be an enzyme delivered to the cell surface itself. Another property is we can couple the heavy and light chain domains of these antibodies fuse them with a proper intercellular domain, and then transduce them or introduce them into T cells, thereby making those T cells CAR T cells, or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. We can take those two domains that I mentioned before, the heavy and light chain, link them together, and actually make these short chain variable fragments, or SCIVs, that can be used as bispecific engagers themselves. So as you can see, there's a lot of different utilities that we can use from the same antibody. The key thing, though, or the major limitation for antibody therapy is that we need to know the recognition domain up front. There are many different classes of antigens that can be expressed that we can harness to our benefit. Many of them are differentiation antigens, glycoproteins, glycolipids, carbohydrates, vascular antigens, but the most common one um, used are typically glycoproteins. And down here is just a table for reference. So, what are the mechanisms via which antibody therapy exert their effects? One method is via direct killing on the tumor itself. And this can be in the function of binding an agonistic receptor, shutting down the tumor cell. It could be binding an antagonistic receptor. A common example of this is there are sometimes tumor antigens that require dimerization, either homo or heterodimerization on the cell surface. And by interrupting this pathway, you basically starve these tumor cells of important downstream mitogenic signals. You can block surface enzymes on, uh, elaborated by uh, tumor cells. And as mentioned before, you can use antibody conjugated to a toxin to deliver relatively potent doses of um, drugs to the tumor and spare systemic toxicity. Another avenue is one that's been talked about a lot today and probably into tomorrow, is usually using the antibody as kind of a starting point or as a lynch point to bring in or elicit a broader immune response. And this can be in the sense of modifying your FC domain so it opsonizes the tumor cell, thereby making it more presentable or more attractive to your professional antigen-presenting cells or macrophages. 
and dendritic cells. Those are somewhere down here. You can actually modify, again, these FC domains to elicit a complement fixation reaction to promote cytotoxicity. You can recruit natural killer cells. And basically, by modifying the biology or the structure of biology of the FC domain, you can often elicit maybe more than one of these pathways, orchestrating a broad or effective immune response. Another thing you can do that's not really widely thought about in the hematologic uh, malignancy space, but we think about this a lot in the solid tumor space, is actually targeting the tumor stroma itself. We know that these tumors don't exist in an island, so to speak, but are oftentimes interacting in a dynamic way with their microenvironment. So perhaps by targeting stromal cells or supporting cells in a microenvironment, we can create a more hostile environment towards the tumor. And again, thinking ahead, you can envision scenarios where we combine this with other forms of therapy that will actually be directly cytotoxic. So in light of all of these benefits, what are some of the setbacks that we see? Because up till now, I've painted basically a very rosy picture. Some of the problems we have is with tumor targeting itself on the antigen receptor. There's been some research out of um, Memorial Sloan Kettering where a single patient was tracked over the course of their disease, this was a patient with ovarian cancer, and biopsies were taken at different times during this patient's uh, path. And what they found was that different sites in the same patient had different tumor microenvironments and different antigen expression levels in different tumors. Those of us who are clinicians wouldn't be surprised by this development because we know that often is the case where we treat patients with antibody-based therapy or some other form of targeted therapy where they have response in certain parts of their body, lymph nodes, liver, and they have progression in other parts of their body. So this is kind of intuitive, but there is evidence for this. Another issue we have is the pharmacokinetics of the antibody itself. We want antibodies that have the appropriate affinity and avidity. We can't have it binding too tightly. We can't have it binding not tightly enough because this has implications for side effects and efficacy. There are issues with penetration into the tumor itself. There's been a lot of work out of Mass General from the uh, Steele Labs under the direction of Dr. Rakesh Jain and a few other labs that show that intravascular tumor pressure and other tumor stromal components actually limit or restrict access of antibodies and other therapeutics into the tumor itself. Receptor occupancy is another issue. Signaling pathway abrogation, which is something our colleagues who study receptor kyrosine um, inhibitors have struggled with for a long time. All of these also have effects in reducing the efficacy of antibody-based therapy. This has not really um, limited our interest in this. And just looking at a survey of the different antibodies in development, just a snapshot in 2018, shows that there, there is still a lot of interest, especially in the phase one group, in developing or bringing to forebear um, a lot of these antibody-based therapies. And this also serves as a reminder that even though we talk about these treatments in the context of cancer, there's a lot of interest in the non-cancer or non-malignant areas as well, harnessing the effect of antibodies. These are just some examples of naked antibodies that we've used with varying degrees of success in gynecologic cancers. We've looked at HER2 binding antibodies in uterine cancer. Unfortunately, our results have not been the same or similar to HER2 targeting and binding in breast cancer. This is a reminder that oftentimes antigen expression on the cell type we still have to go back and look at the tumor histology itself and go back to the biology itself. I think there's a movement now where we've shifted a lot into looking at tumor agnostic markers and treating basically all tumor histologies as relatively the same based on what they express. But this, the HER2 story, is a cautionary tale in that regard that the tumor histology still matters. There is bevacizumab, which is one of our bulwark um, antibodies in ovarian cancer in different stages um, of use. Um, and in uterine cancer as well, and also checkpoint blockade, which you've heard a lot about, and we'll know that here even more later. But the question then turns to, if this is what we can do with naked antibodies, are there other ways we can modify or improve upon um, antibody therapy and antibody drug conjugates come to forbid? Now, these are very complicated and very interesting molecules, and I'd say, it's, if, if there are any pharmacologists in the room, it's a, pharmacolo it's a, it's a pharmacologist's dream, because it contains the antibody module itself, a linker domain, which basically serves to hold in place or bring in the toxin or the payload, oftentimes called the warhead. 
And each of these aspects have different and very important considerations you need to make in order to design an effective therapy. The antigen that you're directing your antibody against has to be something that's expressed in a restricted manner to your tumor. Because as you can imagine, if you have an antigen that's cross-reactive, say on the cornea, you have a high risk of delivering very potent drugs to the cornea and eliciting toxicity. If the antigen you express is heterogeneous in tumor, in the tumor, you have a chance of selectively enhancing the antigen negative tumors and creating a, a, um, a progression of disease. And also, if the toxin is not linked properly, you run the risk of having the warhead deconjugate or cleaved where you don't want it. And oftentimes, this manifest has hepatotoxicity, which is something we see a lot with a lot of our ADC-based therapies. Now, as I mentioned before, many times we can couple these warheads, which are often run up to about a one kilodalton, to different aspects, usually lysine residues, all around the antibody. The theoretical limit of this drug to antibody ratio, or DAR, is about four. So you can get up to four different packages or warheads attached to the same antibody. So let's talk a little bit about the different components that make ADCs very interesting. We already talked about using um, gemtuzumab as an example. And for those of you who are uh, medical history buff, gemtuzumab has a very interesting and storied history where it was initially approved for AML. It's an anti-CD33 targeting uh, drug. And then taken off the market because it was found to have a lot of vaso-occlusive disease, uh, vaso-occlusive side effects in patients and eventually reintroduced uh, later on. So the antibody or the FAB domain has to be specific for your target. The linker has to be important. There are two major types of linkers. We have cleavable linkers and non-cleavable linkers. And this is important because this imparts different properties to the drug itself. For example, cleavable linkers oftentimes require cleavage in the early or late endosomes and sometimes even in the lysosomes by proteolytic cleavage. Whereas non-cleavable linkers are oftentimes only cleaved in lysosomes. And what that means is that if your antigen is not internalized and you use a non-cleavable linker, the only area of effect you'll have is nothing or on the cell surface if it's just randomly cleaved. Additionally, non-cleavable linkers actually require cleavage at the backbone of the antibody itself. And this will change the shape, uh, the size, and the charge of your drug. An example of this is uh, using a non-cleavable linker in a tumor cell that has high expression of efflux pumps. Efflux pumps typically prefer small nonpolar molecules. So by making a charge or non, using a non-cleavable linker to create a large charged molecule within the tumor cell, you enhance or increase the concentration locally in that particular cell of your drug, minimizing tumor escape. But the drawback of that is that because it's so large and charged, you have less bystander effect. So a neighboring tumor cell that has low expression of the antigen will escape. And this is why ADCs are very, very interesting and a challenge as far as design. And then, of course, you have the drug itself. And I'll go into the details of the drugs, but they're very similar to mechanisms that we uh, all are aware of for our, some of our standard chemotherapy drugs, tubulin inhibitors, DNA alkylating agents, et cetera. And some of the toxicities we see with these drug classes are also in play. And some of the mechanisms of escape we see with these drug classes also come into play. So as I mentioned before, differential antigen expression has to be considered. Heterogeneity, which is something that plagues us in the solid tumor space. The mechanism, what are you trying to do? Are you really relying on ADCC as your primary mechanism in addition to the drug delivery? Or is this a tumor that's more amenable to complement fixation and lysis? Is the antigen internalized? There are cases or instances where we want to deliver things to the cell membrane. And in those cases, we would select antigens that are not readily internalized. An example of this is work that's ongoing at Mass General and other places where we actually deliver other antigens or payloads to the cell surface as a means of orchestrating a secondary or broader immune response. If we select an antigen that's internalized, we destroy our product. And lastly, and again, I'll mention this at the end, a very exciting area 
in this field is actually targeting intracellular antigens. This was an area that was thought to be perhaps theoretically impossible in the past, but I'll show you some data that showed a successful targeting of the WT1 antigen, which is thought to be an intracellular um, antigen, and what possibilities this brings to the fore. Your FC class is important. As I mentioned before, there are many, many different types. IgG classes are the most uh, commonly used. There's IgG1, 2, 4. IgG3, for many, many interests, and I can get into it with anyone who's interested in a lecture, is not commonly used. And what you pick is important because, for example, IgG1 supports ADCC, which is, again, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity and complement-mediated cytotoxicity, whereas IgG2 and 4 support these to a much less extent. The number of cysteine residues are important for antibody stability. It also matters where you would put your linkers because now we have to consider steric hindrance between the drug and the antibody um, binding domain. Where is the linker cleaved? There's been a lot of interest in stereochemistry regarding the areas where linkers are cleaved. You do not want them cleaved too early. Again, for systemically administered drugs, oftentimes that will end up giving you liver toxicity which is where a lot of these antibodies have their first pass. If they're too big or your drugs are too large and you form aggregations, again, you will see a lot of perisinusoidal inflammation in the liver, and you can also get a kidney or renal deposition disease similar to uh, what we see in uh, certain autoimmune uh, renal diseases. So understanding the stereochemistry is also very important. What about the toxin or the warhead itself? What kind of design considerations do we need to consider? These are some of the common classes that are mostly used in some of the um, ADCs that are approved today and in advanced clinical testing. We have the orostatin classes, which prevent tubulin polymerization. They're like our classic microtubule inhibitors, paclitaxel being the one that most of you will be aware of. And you can probably guess what sort of side effects we typically see with these, uh, with these class of drugs. The santanoids are also very common, and they're also tubulin class inhibitors. Calicomycins are DNA alkylating agents, they bind in the minor groove of uh, DNA and they, are, and they prevent and they induce double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, Govatecan is a campothecin. This is very similar to irinotecan in the sense that it's a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor. And of course, you wouldn't be surprised that one of the side effects uh, for this drug is diarrhea. In fact, it's been studied in breast cancer where this is one of the toxicities often encountered. The one that's not listed here is a... Um, parallel benzodiazepine class, and these also bind to the minor groove of uh, the DNA, and they, and they, and they uh, cross-link uh, DNA. The number of linkocytes. So you'd want to think that perhaps if the theoretical limit of the amount of payloads you can conjugate is four, why not just make more potent ADCs by conjugating as many as you can? This has issues with the size of the payload and aggregation. So it's Unlike many other aspects of medical oncology, this is one area where more is not always better. Breakdown and off-site, um, off-target toxicity also becomes an issue. And of course, hydroph hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties are also very important. To remind you, if you pick a more hydrophilic warhead, you create a broader response. Because in that particular case, you might be able to have bystander killing of tumor cells that might express low levels of your antigen or even no antigen expression at all. The payload can be effluxed out of your target tumor cell, but then hit a neighboring cell. So they are very important properties where you might actually want to use a very hydrophilic uh, warhead. And as I mentioned before, there are other areas where you might want to use a more hydrophobic warhead. Adotrastuzumab or TDM1 uses a non-cleavable linker that makes it hydrophobic. So you get very high concentrations within these breast cancer cells. So we've spent a lot of time looking at all of these individual components that I talked to you about and improving them to get better and better um, ADCs. To give you some specific examples in the GYN space, We've studied um, DMCU5754A. It's one of the earlier ADCs used in ovarian cancer. It's a MUX16 targeting drug, um, and it's an antibody conjugate. And what's important to look at here 
is that the degree of expression of your antigen or your target matters. This is a waterfall plot where um, the bars that are going downwards indicate a response. And the dotted line here is 30%, which is typically what we use as an objective uh, marker for response. So the bars that dip below this dotted line are the ones you really want to look at. And what's important here is that, for one, all of the patients on this side of the graph have 3 plus expression by immunohistochemistry, and some of them even 2 plus. There are no responders that have minimal or no response of, um, of the antigen. And also, the patients who benefit the longest on the trial, again, are those who have higher expression. And this is a common principle that we found in the GYN space with our ADCs. The higher your expression, the more likely you are to respond. Another example of this is Mervatuximab, which is one of the more advanced um, ADCs that's currently in development. And this targets the folate receptor alpha antigen. These are results from the so-called FORWARD-2 study where we looked at mervatuximab in combination with different chemotherapy agents. The results shown here are for combinations with carboplatin. Combinations with pembrolizumab, doxyl, and a few others were tested, but those results are not currently available. This study was done in parallel with a FORWARD-1 study that looked at single-agent mervatuximab uh, um, tested against investigators' choice of paclitaxel and doxol, which are common drugs we use in ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, this trial was a negative study. The results were published uh, a couple of months ago. And the reason for that was that they saw a much higher overall response rate, which is the amount of tumor shrinkage, in patients treated with the mervatuximab. But they saw no difference in progression-free survival and overall survival amongst all the three arms. And unfortunately, the progression-free survival was their primary objective. Right now, they're in talks to see if there's anything they can do because in the subset analysis, patients who had medium or particularly who had high folate alpha receptors appeared to have longer progression-free survival compared to the chemotherapy arm. And I hope that kind of makes sense why that would be the case. But because it wasn't their primary objective, there's sort of issues with that, with that analysis. So this is the forward two study, again, that shows these are spider plots. So the graphs that are going, this represents individual patients. This is the depth of their response based on the change in tumor size. And as you can see, patients with a high folate alpha receptor, there's more of them, achieving complete responses. This is a 100% change in the tumor size. Whereas if you look at patients with low folate alpha receptor uh, expression, you see only very few responders. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are some of the um, ADCs that we're currently excited about in gynecologic malignancies. And as an inside joke, you notice um, that some of, these have been, um, some of these have been in development for years, years. And development in this area has been plagued by starts and stops. Because as you can imagine, we would perform a phase one study with mixed results, would go back, tweak the linker, try again, tweak the payload, try again, et cetera. Many of these are in the um, orostatin and the mesanthine um, class, and this is just for reference. Some of these antigens are a little bit esoteric, like the NAPI B1 is a sodium-dependent phosphate transporter, mucin-1, trope-2, um, et cetera. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about MUX16 because it's an example that I think is, um, is illustrative of some of the flexibility that we have with antibody therapy. MUX16 is a mucin, um, a very large mucin at that, which is a protein backbone with a lot of these sugar um, kind of fingers, as I like to think of them, sticking out. It binds, it uses um, galactin-3 as a bridge to interact with EGFR integrins, and it also binds to mesothelin. And what this does upon binding is that it promotes a mitogenic signal that's been shown to be important in tumor growth, survival, abrogation of apoptosis, um, et cetera. And if I direct you down to panel D here, what we found is that by using antibodies that selectively bind to GAL3, one of the properties I showed you earlier that we can use antibodies for, binding to ligands, kind of like bevacizumab, we actually abrogate a lot of that intracellular signaling. And we verified this using shRNA against the sugar backbone, so you don't have binding, there is no downstream signaling, and also by using shRNA against GAL3 itself. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about bispecific antibodies, which are a different application for antibody therapy separate from um, ADCs. 
Biospecific antibodies are an interesting offshoot because when we think about classic T cell engagement of tumor cells, you oftentimes require presentation of the antigen in the context of MHC by the target or the tumor. And also, this provides signal one when you have li um, ligation by the T cell receptor, but you also require a signal two, basically a co-stimulatory engagement for you to have full T cell activation and cytotoxicity. What bispecific antibodies do is basically short circuit that pathway by directly bringing together the target cell or the tumor based on an SCIV domain or a module or a cassette that recognizes the tumor antigen, for example, MOX16, and then a cassette or another module that recognizes an antigen expressed on T cells, more commonly used is uh, CD3. And by bringing them together, you form an immune synapse, which subsequently leads to cytotoxicity. The benefit of this approach is that this activated T cell can then go on to engage and kill other um, tumor cells. Now, you've used antibody biology based on the SCIV to elicit a CD8 or cytotoxic, um, a, a cytotoxic um, mechanism or a cytotoxic effector pathway. And what this does is that we typically characterize T cells as living drugs because then this particular T cells can then go on to do several rounds of cytotoxicity long after this SCIV uh, or this bispecific has been degraded. Or like antibodies where when they're gone, your efficacy kind of tapers off. These are common examples of um, bispecifics currently in testing in gynecologic cancers. These are the targets, B786, uh, folate, EPCAM, and uh, the folate one has been in development since 1995. This is an example of preclinical data for one of our MUX16 directed um, bispecifics where we would take the mouse with um, a particular gynecologic tumor, inject them with bispecifics and activated T cells, and then look at how they do over a period of time. As you can see, we see increased IL-2, which you've heard a lot about this morning, and we also see increased interferon gamma, and this leads to um, a survival advantage. The two key points here is some of the things we can learn from preclinical data. One, these bispecifics require repeat infusion. Bispecific engagers do not have the FC domain or the stalk that antibodies have, and as such are significantly less stable and more prone to being degraded and being um, excreted in the urine. And secondly, single agent therapy is not really the way to go. This is an example of work out of uh, Sloan Kettering showing how we can use bispecific engagers to target intracellular antigens. And this is uh, work done out of the um, David Scheinberg lab looking at the anti-WT1 um, antigen. And you can ask yourself, well, why would you want to pursue this sort of approach? If you already know what your tumor of interest is, and you know what the antigen is, you would just make a tumor-specific bite, like MUC16 for pancreatic and ovarian cancer, or MUC1 for um, breast cancer, or mesothelin for mesothelioma. Well, the benefit of targeting an intracellular antigen is that you can use it for a wide variety of tumors. So this is the same WT1 against ovarian cancer, against ALL, a hematologic malignancy, and also against mesothelioma. So this is still work that's fairly early um, in its development, but this targeting intracellular antigens creates sort of a broader or is, a, is an untapped promise. And if you use your imagination, you can say, what about if we can detect mutant P53 on the cell surface? Perhaps we can make a bispecific against that. And as we all know, many of our cancers have aberrant uh, expression of um, P53. Our most advanced bispecific engager is a product made from um, Regeneron, REGN4018. It is a MUX16 and CD3 binding molecule. It is only in clinical trials. It is not available for wide use. And the results, even now, are still too early to tell. Another approach that I mentioned about is using radionucleotides tagged to antibodies for various purposes, imaging, and perhaps in the future, therapy. Again, because of the specificity conferred by these antibodies. And the way this works is that you would take your standard antibody against the antigen that you've predetermined, but instead of a warhead or a drug, as in an ADC, you would link a radiotherapeutic. Indium has been commonly used in cancer for imaging or tumor imaging purposes. The data I'll show you today is for zirconium, 
If you think ahead, for those of you who treat prostate cancer, um, a radionucleotide like radium, that's an alpha emitter that has a very short wavelength path and high stopping power, what if you could link that perhaps to an antibody and deliver that systemically as a radionucleotide therapy? But radionucleotides as therapy are still a way off. Right now, what we commonly use them for is imaging. This is an example of a zirconium labeled MUX16 platform. These are two different MUX16 antibodies. See, um, this is uh, 9C9 and this is 4H11. These are mouse that are imaged with um, immunopets, and the tumor is right here. And as you can see, over time, 24, 48, 72 hours, et cetera, there is increased accumulation of the radionucleotide in the tumor. And this serves as a reminder for me to remind you that again, when these drugs are injected, the first pass is in the liver. So if your linker conjugation chemistry is inaccurate, your drug will not make it through phase one studies because of significant liver toxicity and vaso-occlusive disease like the gentuzumab story I alluded to earlier. The same thing. And the difference, you can say, what is the difference between these two? They're both targeting MUX16. The difference is the rate of internalization or recycling of the antigen is very different based on where this antibody binds. And there's not even enough time for us to talk about that today. These days, there is no immunotherapy course that's free from CAR T cell. In fact, a time will come when you know, people at the grocery store will stop you to talk about CAR T cells. So I'm obligated by law to talk about CAR T cells. And they're very interesting and very unique in the sense that they bring together some of our best ideas about what we know about T cells, what we know about B cells and antibodies, and what we know about vaccines when we think about broadening the immune response beyond the T cell target itself. And the way this works is by afterphoresis of peripheral circulating T cells and purification from patients, we introduce a construct or a vector that encodes the SCFV and a chimeric domain, oftentimes borrowed from different cells even. Um, and then we reinfuse that. And upon reinfusion, we expect that these newly minted CAR T cells will seek out the tumor, engage them, not via the T cell receptor, but via this chimeric or modified receptor derived from the SCFV and lead to tumor, um, to, um, tumor cytotoxicity. A more cartoon, a skeletal diagram showing what's borrowed and why it's called a chimeric receptor is again the heavy and light chain sequence makes the top. We take aspects of the intercellular signaling from TCRs, latch that on, and this is what it would look like if you were actually constructing this in the lab. What about if we bring together what we, our best properties with CAR T cells and mix them together with SCFEs or with bispecifics? So you can create a CAR T cell that does its CAR T cell thing, which is engage tumors by itself, but also secrete bispecifics or secrete blocking SCFEs. And this was a recent, pap uh, a recent paper showing such a thing where we had a MUX16 directed CAR T cell that also secreted a small blocking SCFV against PD-1, which would be very similar to taking something like pembrolizumab and cutting off the FC domain. And the benefit of this approach is that as the CAR T cells are engaged and divide in the tumor microenvironment, you get locally high concentrations of your checkpoint delivery or your payload. So again, this speaks to the versatility or the adaptability of antibody-based platforms. Your imagination really and our, and our engineering, our cell engineering principles are the limitations and of course our imagination. And these are just some, a very, very, very selected list of current CAR T cells um, trials that are ongoing. MUX16 is a very common target that's ongoing at Sloan Kettering. There are several mesothelium platform CAR T cells, and of course WT1, which is going on at uh, Roswell Park. But again, the CAR T cell work, if you rank them in order of advanced or how close they are to clinic, ADCs would probably be first, very, very close or, or in the second place would be uh, bispecific engages. I showed you the uh, REGN or the Regeneron product. And then CAR T cells would be, you know, a couple, two, three, four generations behind and represents untapped potential. So this is my last slide and I'll be happy to take any questions. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yeki. Questions for uh, for Yeki? Uh, 
So maybe I can kick off then. So um, I mean, the car T, um, you know, we can't escape car T, and the, the, we, we have uh, Mark <laughs> Leake is going to be giving another talk uh, t uh, tomorrow, I believe, um, on car T's. But you know, um, you know, the challenge has really been for car T field to get into to solid tumours, mm -hmm. um, and, and yet, yet with perhaps, uh, do you think ovarian cancer could present a perfect opportunity to be successful there? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we, one of the approaches that we're taking in the MUC 16 directed CAR T cell uh, trial, it's a phase one that's ongoing at Sloan Kettering, is that we actually deliver the CAR T cells in an IVIP manner. Now, this is a, a delivery method that we've used in ovarian cancer treatment for a very long time, where some of your therapy is delivered into the intercavitary space, in this case, the peritoneum, and then the rest of it delivered IV. And we do think that this overcomes some of the peritoneal um, concentration issues that we've had. A recent trial with the mesothelin, or the mesothelin car, I think was presented at ASCO CITSI, I think, this, this past, uh, this year, which showed that interpleural delivery of a mesothelin-directed CAR T cell with checkpoint blockade was actually very effective and had higher response rates than would have been otherwise predicted, or um, predicted uh, historically or by checkpoint blockade alone. So I think there's still a lot of issues to solve because with CAR T cells, we oftentimes have to balance toxicity from having immune activation and cytokine release syndrome versus potency or efficacy. And there are people who will say, you know, deal with efficacy first, solve toxicity later, which has been our oncology, solid term oncology kind of approach. But there are other people that say, no, no, that's unacceptable. In this modern age, issues with toxicity and efficacy kind of have to go uh, hand in hand. Another approach that we're looking at is actually decreasing tumor vascular pressure based on work from Rakesh Jain and others, that there are drugs that we can use to remodel the tumor stroma, um, less fibrinogenic, decreased pressure, and perhaps that will help. People are looking at coast, other co-stimulatory molecules, and of course, combinations with checkpoint blockade. Uh, Yeko, that was a fabulous talk. Um, you mentioned and you highlighted some examples where, you know, drugs in development since 1995, yeah. or, you know, years in, in this start and stop. How do we do better, like, and, and avoid that in, the, in this field? Like, you... Great question. I have a bias in that I spend a good deal of my time in the lab. And having been on both sides, where we look at the preclinical data and some of what goes into developing or bringing forth an IND and bringing forth a clinical trial, when we look at it very closely, oftentimes there's a mismatch between some of the tumor types that were studied in the lab versus the indications that we go forward with in clinic. A common example of this is, for those of you who are in the lab, using one tumor type or one cell line and using that as basically the sole rationale or efficacy in that cell type for your clinical trial. We've moved away from that, by which we now use two cell lines, um, but that is clearly not enough especially when you look at ADCs, where bystander killing is an important factor. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic issues are important. Linkers are important. Some of these things we can't even test in vitro. So I think a lot of that start and stop has been trial and error with linkers. And a lot of it has just been an eagerness or an enthusiasm to get our ideas to, the, to trial without fully doing some of what we, some of us in the lab would consider due diligence and, and good bench science work. But unfortunately, with a lot of immunotherapy, a lot of our learning, unfortunately, has to happen in our patients because there are lots of things that we don't really consider or don't really think about. For example, even within different patients, the amount of proteolytic activity in your lysosomes are different. So if you have a linker that's non-cleavable and you require high activity of lysosomal enzymes to break this down, Genetic differences, background differences, ethnic differences can affect these. And there's no way, no way you can show that even in our most advanced, we don't use primate models anymore, but even in our most advanced preclinical models. So unfortunately, some of this learning is going to come the hard way in our phase one studies. But there's a lot we can also do in the lab to increase our chances of success. Thank you. <laughs>